Welcome to Life Study of the Bible with Witness Lee, brought to you by Living Stream Ministry. Witness Lee faithfully served the Lord for more than seven decades, co-laboring with Watchman Nee in China in the first half of the 20th century, before continuing his ministry in Taiwan, later in America, and eventually over the entire earth. He spoke these weekly Life Study messages before thousands of people, and much of his speaking has been published as over 400 titles. These life studies are perhaps his most significant work, taking 21 years for him to complete, and we're happy today to be able to bring you selected portions from those messages. If you'd like to find out more about his ministry, about the life studies themselves, and Living Stream Ministry, please visit our website, lsm.org. Now let's join today's program. The books of First and Second Chronicles are unique among the books of history in the Old Testament in that they trace the history of God's move in man all the way back to Adam. We know the story. In the beginning, God created the universe. But one in that universe rebelled against God, corrupting and ruining his entire creation thereby. So God came in and restored the spoiled situation and in the process created man in his image, and with his likeness. This makes man unique in all of God's creation, for man's destiny, as revealed in God's word, is that he is of God's kind, with the capacity to contain God's life and nature, making him not just a good man, but making him through God's full salvation a duplication of Christ, the first God-man. Matt Miller's here. As we uh, pick up the life study of First Chronicles, good to have you, Matt, on the other side of the mic today. Really glad to be here, Chris. Uh, glad I could join you. It was interesting as we began this life study. The very first verse in Chronicles is uh, the first verse of a long genealogy that lasts nine chapters, and it just says, Adam, Seth, Enosh. That really sort of fixes us in, at the point in time in which uh, the Lord is burdened when he comes to this uh, book of the history, doesn't it? It really does, and... Uh, I was considering as we get into the life study of Chronicles, or this is the second message on Chronicles, how we're really touching God's heart in his original creation of man. And I, I'm smiling here as I consider how many people are studying Chronicles from the view of God's <laughs> original heart's desire in the creation of man. Yeah, we've been through First and Second Samuel now. We've been through uh, Kings. These are other books in this uh, section of books in the Old Testament called the Books of History. 12 in total, but all of the others mainly are focused on the history of God's people, Israel. And we know, obviously, as we study the end time events, this is important. And so uh, it has some interest as we go back and look in the Old Testament. But we're really touching now God's, as you said, God's purpose, his original intention in creation. And hence, Chronicles takes us right back to Adam. Uh, so I've picked a verse from chapter 1. We'll hear Witness Lee talk about this verse, chapter 1 of Genesis, verse 26, Matt. And I hope it confirms uh, some of the things we were trying to convey in the opening here. Very good. And God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of heaven and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Then I want to jump ahead now. This is, of course, God's original creation of man before the fall. After the fall, after the serpent came and injected himself into the whole situation, uh, we have a very positive reference, actually. Uh, God, once again, speaking about this man that he had created, but now in a uh, future sense. And in chapter 3, verse 15, he said, as uh, the Lord was speaking to this evil one who had corrupted his uh, work that was so marvelous. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise you on the head, but you will bruise him on the heel. A prophecy there, isn't there, Matt, that we should not lose sight of? I think that's the first prophecy of the coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's amazing how patient God has been since that original prophecy. It's been 4,000 years from the time of that prophecy until Christ actually came. As you were reading that verse, I was just thankful that we have such a patient God because I know 
He's patient with me, and I need that patience. We'll see that patience uh, really developed in a wonderful way in, uh, I think, the second section today of Witness Lee's portion. But right now, why don't we join him for his opening word in this life study? Our God created the heaven and the earth and the angels. One of the angels rebelled to become his enemy. They ruined the original creation. Then God came in to repair. And after the uh, remodeling of the universe, God, among dead billions of atoms, needed to talk about other things, just living creatures. God created a lot, but not one like him. <laughs> Not one like him. So eventually he created man, but not in mankind. I must tell you, in this universe, there's no mankind. God created a man in his image. Amen. After his likeness. This is in God's kind. Amen. When God looked at these two, Adam and Eve, these are his hobbies. What could make God happy? When he look at Adam, <laughs> this is my hobby. This is my kind. But that hobby was just about 10%. Because man only had, by then, God's image. God's likeness, but not God's life, not God's nature, not God himself. So, haha, God, according to his eternal plan, he himself has to become a man. Matt, I think it's fair to tell our uh, listeners right up front that this life study of uh, Chronicles was very significant in the ministry of Witness Lee. It was near the end of his life. It was one of the last life studies that he uh, gave, and he was seeing something and burdened to bring us all into the realization of something that will be developed as we go forward. So we want to be careful not to skip over something that needs to be developed and needs to be explained or clarified a little bit. A couple of things popped out at me in this first section. Uh, first was his statement that God did not create man in man's kind. But there is no such thing, biblically, as mankind. Man is created as part of God's kind. Let's talk about that. Very important distinction, Chris. I'm glad you brought that up. In Genesis chapter 1, let me read a few verses. Verse 24, it says, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. Right. And it was so. Then verse 25, And God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and of the cattle, after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground, after its kind. And God saw that it was good. So there's this emphasis. It's almost like God is emphasizing that all these creatures, the crawling things, the cattle, they were all made according to their own kind. But then when he gets to verse 26, the very next verse, it yeah. says, then God said, and let us make man in our image. So when he talks about man, he never says that man will be created after man's kind, after his own kind, like all the other animals, but he will be made according to God's image. Right. What a striking picture. Yeah. And it's very good how Witness Lee brings this out. Man was not made according to mankind. Mankind, there's all kinds of kind out there, but there's not a mankind. Now, that, the word mankind is, is a word that we use to describe history and in English in literature, but it's not a biblical term. The term mankind is not biblical because man was not made according to his own kind. He was made according to God's kind, which is the very desire of God in making man. And it touches the very heart of God, which is the second word I think you want to bring up, which is God's hobby. Exactly. 
So. Yeah, well, you led into it very well. Let me just, my thought was uh, just to point out that when he uses this term, man is God's hobby, he is not uh, speaking this in a kind of a frivolous way. Hobby can be a very light sort of a meaningless word, but not so in this context. He's really implying what you just put your finger on, and, and I'd ask you to develop a bit more, and that is that in the center of God's heart is a longing and an eternal desire. And the focus of that longing and that desire, that good pleasure of God, is man, isn't it? Absolutely. And that's the point that Witness Lee's trying to make here when he says that man was God's hobby, that this is what God was focused on in all of creation. Man is just not another part of God's creation, as many people today would like you to believe. No, he's not another part of creation. He's the central part of creation. He's the purpose of all creation. Zechariah 12.1 says that, that God stretched out the heavens, laid the foundation of the earth, and formed the spirit of man within him. Man's spirit is the center of all of God's, not only God's creation of the earth, but the whole universe. And that's why Witness Lee uses this term, a hobby. This is what makes God happy. When God thinks of man being made according to his image, that God could be expressed and deal with his enemy, this is the very thing that makes God happy. God gets excited, just like we get excited exactly. when we're dealing with a hobby. I was thinking about myself, and I don't want to expose myself too much. But I have hobbies. I have things that I really enjoy. They may not be the same thing that you enjoy, Chris, but Mm -hmm. I enjoy these things. And they make me happy. And I get happy doing these things. Okay. And we all have hobbies like that, that we enjoy. Okay. God's hobby, his enjoyment (laughs) is having a man that expresses him on the earth and represents him. Significant, isn't it, that when he did come to join himself to creation, he came not as any of these other creatures not even as uh, one of the most intelligent, a chimp or a dolphin or porpoise. He came as a man. That's right. What is in the center of God's heart, what's in the center of his plan and all his doings, even in creation, even in the universe and the marvelous uh, creation that he has provided for us. What's uh, driving and motivating him in all of this activity is man and his ultimate desire for man. All right, let's go on to the next portion, Matt. Here, I want to come back to the promise that we received in Genesis chapter 315, the promised seed that would bruise or crush the head of the serpent. In Second Samuel, one of the books of history, chapter 7, verses 12 through 14, a passage we spent a lot of time on when we were in Samuel. When your days are fulfilled and you sleep with your fathers, this is speaking to David, King David, I will raise up your seed after you, which will come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. It is he who will build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. This is a continuation of that same prophecy in Genesis 3.15, isn't it? It is. All right, let's join Witness Lee once more. Our God is almighty, omnipotent, but he always would not do things too fast. Not like us. We had a dream last night, and this morning we did it. God was not like that. Our God is very slow, full of patience. So after 2,000 years, up to Abraham time, God didn't do anything. After another 1,000 years, to David time, God still wouldn't do anything. But God told David that David will have his seed. And that seed will be called the Son of God. He prophesied this, but he didn't do it. After 1,000 more, 4,000 years from the creation of Adam, God one day came to be conceived in virgin and even to be born out of the virgin. Where is God? God is in him. He is a man, God man. And then one day he said, I'm the Sagrian. I will fall into the earth and die there and grow up to become many grains. The first grain was a prototype. And the many grains produced by that one grain through death and resurrection are the mass reproduction. Reproduction of what? 
reproduction of God. Have you ever heard of this? You seen this in Bible? Yes. Where? Where to go? John 12, 24. These are his real hobby. Well, I think certainly he's given us another item here that needs some development. John 12, 24. Let's look at this verse. Truly I say to you, unless the grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. I think we're all familiar with this concept. Uh, You plant one seed and there's a marvelous reproduction. But let's address it this way, Matt. In what sense are we a reproduction and in what sense are we not? Because I think both are equally important. Well, Chris, it's hard for me not to refer to another verse, and I want to do that. It's 2 Corinthians 3.18, and it says, But we all with unveiled face, beholding and reflecting like a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, even as from the Lord's Spirit. Right. Okay. Now, this verse says that we have an unveiled face, and we're beholding the Lord. As we're beholding the Lord, we're beholding him, we're also then reflecting him. We become like a mirror. So on the earth, a miraculous phenomena has occurred, and that's why God is so happy about it. God's happy when on the earth there's mirrors reflecting the glory of the Lord, and they are being transformed into the same image. So God's image is being expressed on the earth through people who are beholding him. Yeah. People who are beholding the Lord. The verse in John 12, in his death, he went into the ground as one grain of wheat. But in resurrection, many grains of wheat came up. So in his resurrection, all the believers, we were born again. In Christ's resurrection, we have the same life and nature as Christ. We're born again. That means we're sons of God. He's the firstborn son of God. We're the many sons of God. We have the same life and nature as our big brother. Of course, Christ is God and we worship him as God. But in his resurrection, his very life and nature was imparted into us. You know, we want to be humble. We want to be contrite and not raise ourselves up. But we have to acknowledge the fact that God did make us the same as Christ in life and in nature. We're his brothers. So not to acknowledge that is to not give him the proper respect and honor for what he's done in his death and resurrection. Yeah, and it's also not to acknowledge a key component of his resurrection. Uh, He was raised certainly for our justification, but not only so. He was raised with this resurrection life, which is his very life. It contains his life nature, and that's imparted to us as a result of his resurrection. At the same time, Matt, to say that we become a kind of a reproduction or duplication does not mean that we're Uh, involved in any way in Christ's omniscience. No omniscience, no omnipotence, and no omnipresence. Those are things that are unique to God and his Godhead. But we do have his life and his nature. We can love people with his love. We can be patient with people like he's patient with us. Right. We can shine. We can shine on people, not by ourselves, but Christ in us becomes a light to others. We've all had, every genuine believer has had this experience. I liked your uh, uh, development or connection of uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18 to this uh, topic that we're talking about today. All right, Matt, uh, we've read John 12.24. Let's go back to Witness Lee for the final portion. He'll develop this thought even a bit more. Suppose you were a God today from the heavens. You look at us. Are you not happy? He would say, angels, come, come, come to see. What are those there? They look like me. They speak like me, they live like me, they do things like me. The nature is my nature, and the life is my life. Their constitution is my constitution, and I am in them. What is this, dear saints? Is this a dream? But, there's a big but. God would say, well, all these are my hobbies, are not so complete, not so perfect. Why? Although they have my life, but they don't live by my life. Some do. Even some do, but they do not live 
by God's life day and night. Sometimes in the morning, they live there by God's life. But noon time, the larger temper, they live by scorpion's life. So what our God is doing today is a transformation work. To know who you are and to realize who you are, this changes you. This revolutionizes you. My, if all the Christians today, thousands, millions, even ten millions, all would realize that I am the God-man. I tell you, the world today will be different. How great is a miracle and how deep is the mystery that God had a way to be joined and mingled with man. Such an economy, even the angels, with all the world people, they don't understand. But this is out of the hobby of God's desire. This is to attain to the high peak of God's goal. That's a wonderful picture he kind of portrayed there at the beginning of his portion. God calling over the angels and pointing down to the earth. And what he's pointing them to are all these mirrors you were talking about a minute ago, wasn't he, Matt? He was, and I appreciate that example because it's exactly what's happening. When people are enjoying the Lord, they're beholding him in the Lord's presence, they're praying, they're, they're living a life in the Spirit, within the Lord's presence. It's a miraculous transformation. But I also en- enjoyed his follow-up to that, that if we don't, enjoy him, then God's hobby is not complete. Right. We're not expressing him. And all of a sudden, this miraculous transformation changes. And these same people who are expressing Christ one minute, the next minute they're expressing a scorpion. I think that was the term Witness yeah, Lee used. Did. In other words, something full of poison. The Pharisees were called a brood of vipers, a children of the devil, because they were full of poison. And, and even at one point, uh, Peter is, is uh, in a sense, congratulated by the Lord for uh, his, his great discernment of uh, God's revelation. And then the next minute he turns around and he refers to him as Satan. So Yeah, that was Matthew chapter 16. Exactly. And so I think we all have this experience, or at least I'm confessing that I at least do. Yeah, I think you could safely say we all have this experience. Well, my wife knows me better than anyone, and she can verify this fact that at one minute I'm I'm like Christ. It's Christ living in me. But after a certain period of time, all of a sudden, I'm expressing something poisonous and hurtful and something I need to apologize for. This is the process we're in, and I'm thankful that God is patient with us. We should be patient with one another. And if, as Witness Lee said, the millions would realize who they really are in Christ, that they're just a reproduction of Christ like the many grains, the whole world would be a different place. A much different place. Well, Matt, we have the high peak of God's goal, his closing words today. And I think that really says uh, what the topic, what the central line will be of this entire life study of First and Second Chronicles. So we hope all of you listening will stay with us. We would really encourage you, particularly because we are touching some things that are very high, very deep, and uh, need careful consideration in your own uh, scrutiny, your own study, your own comparing these verses. It would be marvelous if you got the printed life study volume for First and Second Chronicles, uh, which also contains a couple of other books, doesn't it, Matt? Kind of a, a bonus supplement here. Yeah, the title is uh, of this particular life study volume is First and Second Chronicles. Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Well, that's a a good opportunity then. Uh, Get that volume now, then you can study along with us and join us each day really fully in the thought and heart of what we're touching, this high peak of God's goal. Uh, The toll-free number, if you'd like to contact us uh, to get that volume, 1-888-LIFE-STUDY, 888-543-3788. For Matt Miller, I'm Chris Wilde. Thanks very much for listening today. Thank you for listening to Life Study of the Bible with Witness Lee, brought to you by Living Stream Ministry. 
The focus of Living Stream is the works of Watchman Nee and Witness Lee, two co-laborers with the Lord in China in the first half of the 20th century. After World War II, Witness Lee brought this ministry first to Taiwan, then later to North America and eventually to the entire world. For more than 20 years, he spoke these life study messages, unveiling how each book of the Bible shows God's eternal plan. God, through Christ, wants to dispense his life and nature into redeemed man so that man would become God's expression, enlargement, counterpart, and habitation. These studies go far beyond mere doctrine and unveil a personal, practical, and experiential Christ. In these short 26-minute programs, we summarize and condense Witness Lee's rich speaking. But to enjoy all the riches in these messages, we hope you'll visit our website at lifestudy.com. There, you can read all of the Life Study messages absolutely free of charge. You can even create your own Life Study reading schedule or download more Life Study audio programs just like this one and all at no cost. Again, the website, lifestudy.com. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Follow us on social media or visit our website for more from Living Stream Ministry.